All right. Good morning, class. How are you guys doing? Ready for the exam? Yeah. yeah? Great. Uh, so just a reminder: on uh, Friday, we're gonna have our midterm number one. The coverage will be from the beginning of the semester to the section on uh, moments and variance. Uh, we will not test you uh, to memorize any of these random variables, uh, including Bernoulli, binomial, Poisson, geometric. Uh, we're not going to ask you to memorize those formulas. So basically, anything from uh, the Bernoulli random variable will not be included in the midterm. But anything before that, I may ask you to derive the expectation and variance given a PMF. That would be ex uh, required in the syllabus, okay? Um, programming questions will not be asked, no proofs. Uh, the format will be exactly the same as the previous exams where you have uh, true and false, multiple choices, and uh, questions. Uh, true and false and multiple choices, we do not offer partial credits. However, uh, for the uh, long questions, uh, we will give you as much partial credits as possible, so please, write down something meaningful, okay? All right, um, uh, as I mentioned multiple times, uh, there will be no, uh, no textbook, no uh, notes, uh, no cheat sheet, whatever. Uh, the formula sheet will be printed as part of the exam, and you can uh, preview those formulas uh, from the course website. Is it okay? No calculators. Um, now, on the exam day, uh, we're going to assign the seats uh, to you. So as you walk into this classroom, uh, we'll project the seating map as well as the seating assignment for you. So just follow the instructions. Uh, we may also ask you to put down a little number on the top corner so that as we sort the exams, it will be a lot easier for us. Okay. So that's the plan. So uh, please come to the classroom a few minutes earlier. So uh, as soon as the classroom, uh, the previous class is empty, we can walk in and then we can set up the thing. Right? Duration of the exam will be uh, 45 to 50 minutes, depends on whether we have another class uh, lining up. Uh, but basically the, the exam was designed to be completed within 30 or 35 minutes. So we should, we should be able to uh, finish everything on time. Uh, assuming that you are familiar with the, the topic, right? Uh, of course, we understand that there are always uh, struggles. Uh, so at least when I designed the test, I, I, every time, you know I've been designing the test for so many years, I sort of know the, 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 the length, um, not to make it too long, right? So that's promised. Any questions about the uh, coming midterm number one? Good. All right, so... Uh, I look forward to see you on, on Friday. So uh, for today, uh, I want to finish uh, this chapter three, and I want to talk about uh, one more random variable. This is the Poisson random variable. Uh, it is my favorite random variable besides the normal distribution, uh, because I, you know, I do uh, cameras, I do lens, I do uh, sensors. Uh, this is really the random variable that I deal with every day. So I have a lot to say about this random variable. Um, but because there's so many things to say about this random variable, I need to decide what to tell you. Uh, it's just too much. So I want to co uh, comment on a couple of things. Uh, one is, what is this random variable? Uh, how do we calculate probabilities from this random variable? What does it mean? What is the physical meaning of this random variable? I also want to uh, spend some time uh, showing you where this uh, beautiful Poisson equation comes from. Uh, so every random variable, we have a probability mass function. Right? Uh, Bernoulli is very easy to visualize, a conflict, yes and no, and so your P and one minus P. Binomial is very easy to visualize. You have a sequence of random variables, sum them up, um, so you get this uh, N times P, uh, which is the expectation. Uh, geometry is also relatively easy to see, right? You have multiple failures followed by a success. Uh, this Poisson random variable, the PMF is a little bit difficult to understand. You have some e to the power something and something, factorial something. Um, so where does it come from? I want to spend some time talking about that. I have two, two perspectives of deriving that Poisson formula so that you can see uh, from multiple angles. 
All right, so um, to start with, I want to um, comment on this camera. Of course, this is my favorite object. Um, so um, you know, the, the, the signal that the camera collects is basically a, a collection of photons, uh, all stored in charges or energy. The arrivals of these photon cans, uh, as a matter of fact, it comes from the Poisson distribution. Okay. Now we can of course debate whether this is true or not, and there are, there are, you can easily create scenarios that the photon arrivals they do not follow a Poisson distribution. But assuming in an ideal situation, uh, then I would say that the, the photon arrivals will follow a Poisson distribution. What does it mean? Okay, what does it mean? I have a random variable x which defines the number of photons. If you do not like cameras, it's also okay. You can think about Uber. The, the, the number of calls for a taxi, okay? Or if you like telephone phone calls, it could be how many phone calls are arriving at your telephone system, right? So as long as you have this discrete sequence of events, uh, you, can, you can map it to the story. So x is the number of photons, and now I would say x equals to k, right? So x equals to k. So now I need to, uh, this k would be the, the, the number of, of um, uh, photons. Uh, this is a random variable, this is the state. Now before I talk about this k and x, there should also be a definition of the duration, right? Because if I, if I set the time to be longer, of course you have more photons compared to when you have a short duration of few photons. Now if you have ever played a camera before, there's a thing called a shutter, right? So, so the shutter speed, if you make the shutter speed to be a uh, higher speed, that means your duration would be shorter, then you have fewer photons, which would be pretty good for slow motion or fast motion? For fast motion, okay? So you, you, if someone is walking, you have a dog running, you want to capture that kind of uh, dynamic scene, you want to make your shutter as, as quickly as possible so that the duration is short, so what would happen to your image? You wouldn't have any blur, but then you're gonna suffer a lot of noise. Do you see the picture, right? Now versus if you make the, make the shutter really, really long, you know, long exposure time, then uh, you wouldn't have too much noise. However, the, the object moves, so you have a lot of blur. So that should be pretty intuitive, right? So there is also a duration here. We call it the integration period. That is the time t. Um, the photon arrival will come with a rate. It's defined by this constant alpha. So when you have this alpha, which is the rate, rate will be the number of photons per second. The unit is number of photons per second. I will also tell you the duration. It could be one millisecond or 30 millisecond. So you multiply this rate with the duration, that would be the mean photon count, not per second, just the mean photon count inside this period. Okay, so that's the mean photon count. Now, let's go back to this thing here. I have a random variable. The, the, the exact number of photon counts is a, is a random number. I do not know, right? I walk into this experiment and then today it will give me five photons. Tomorrow I do the same experiment, it's gonna give me two photons, right? It's a random number. That two photon, five photon is this k. I ask if my rate, right, this rate is a high rate, the duration is a long duration, then of course lambda will be a big number. I ask, well, what is the probability that you're gonna get a very, very small k? Unlikely, because your mean photon count will be high, so you expand that this thing should be concentrated at some high number. Does that make sense, right? So if you have a big lambda, you should expect this x will have a higher chance of residing on the large k. Whereas if you have a small lambda, you will expect that this x will mostly concentrate at a small k. Okay? So this k is just a dummy number, uh, it's a dummy variable. This dummy variable will just be the, 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 all the possible states. So if we call the PMF, this is the k, so you can say k equals to zero, k equals to one, two, uh, three, all the way to infinity. And let's say your lambda is small, uh, if your lambda is small, then you would expect it to be more concentrated at a small number. Whereas your lambda, if your lambda is big, 
uh, then we should expect to see more Kangs uh, on the high ends. That is very intuitive. Okay, so that's the PMF. Now, on the right-hand side of this equation, you can see this, this funny thing here. That's not a very easy thing to understand. Now, compared to Bernoulli random variable, P and 1 minus P, binomial random variable of n choose k p to the power k 1 minus p to the power n minus k. That's very easy, right? Very easy to understand. But here you have this lambda to the power k, k factorial e to the power minus lambda. Where, where does it come from? <laughs> right, where does it come from? Now, that, that I need to uh, spend some time explaining uh, the origin of this beautiful formula. Okay, for now, let's uh, spend some time. Just understand, um, given this formula, uh, how can we derive the expectation? How can we derive the variance? Uh, how do we uh, visualize this formula? All right, so let's go ahead and talk about a couple of things about this Poisson random variable. Uh, if x is a Poisson random variable, then the PMF is given by this formula, as I showed you before. You have, uh, you have uh, one parameter, lambda, okay? Uh, unlike the binomial random variable where you have two parameters, uh, here you only have one parameter, which is the lambda. Lambda defines the average count. Uh, and underneath this lambda, you remember there's an alpha, there's a t. Alpha defines the rate, and t defines the integration time, okay? Alpha and t. Uh, the running index k uh, will go from 0, 1, 2, all the way to infinity, including the 0. You can ask, uh, what is the probability of having no photon in this, in this period of time? You can ask, right? So zero is included. Uh, it goes all the way to infinity. You can say, what is the probability of getting 10 million photons in this period of time? You can ask, right? So it is not upper bounded. Uh, this parameter lambda is, of course, positive because you're asking the rate times so the duration time, alpha times t. Alpha positive, t is positive. Of course, it's positive. So this is a positive constant. Um, the notation for this x is uh, x tilde Poisson lambda. Lambda is the, um, the only parameter here. So just to recap, uh, understanding the parameters here, uh, x is the number of arrivals. That can be your photon count. That can be your electrons. That can be uh, the phone calls, uh, how many calls for the taxi, et cetera. So anything about the arrivals can be mapped by this uh, random variable x. Alpha is the arrival rate number per unit time. That could be a second, that could be millisecond. You can define that. T is the time, and lambda is alpha times T, which is the average number within T unit of time. So these four symbols should be, uh, these three symbols are well defined. Then alpha uh, times T will be giving you uh, lambda. So these are all defined, okay? Now, let us look at uh, the, uh, the shape of this random variable. Um, this is the CDF of a Poisson random variable. And the CDF of a Poisson random variable uh, is nothing but just a cumulative sum of the Poisson distribution. So you can have, uh, if I tell you all these Poisson PMFs, then you can draw the CDF. But before I go to the CDF, let's go to the PMF uh, for a moment. This is the, the shape of the PMF for Lambda equals to 1, 4, and 10. So lambda equals to 1 is a very small lambda. It means that on average, you get one photon for the duration that you study. So you can see here that when lambda is 1, uh, the most of the energy is concentrated at a very, very small value, which is intuitive because if your average arrival rate is low, then I should have a higher chance of getting no photon or one photon, some chance of getting two photon, three photon, but not really any chance of getting 11 photons, right? Because your arrival rate is small. So I should expect to see more events happening at uh, zero or one. As you increase your lambda to four or 10, then you should expect that, um, that the chance of getting zero photons will, be, uh, will become smaller but then the chance of getting 10 photons or 12 photons will become higher. So uh, there should be a shift of the shape of this distribution from more concentrated at a small number gradually 
to a number that is spreading out and then becoming uh, more concentrated in the in a high number. Now the 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 spread of the distribution is going to go out, okay? Uh, because as you have a, a larger lambda, as we're going to show, that the variance of the random variable becomes bigger. That's something we need to prove. Now on the CDF side, if I give you the PMF, just do the cumulative sum, then you can get the CDF shape. Again, there is no simple formula for that. Uh, uh, we just uh, use this uh, an, an distribution. Okay, so now let's calculate some uh, simple examples. I have a telephone center and then the average number of phone calls is lambda calls. Now that, has, that lambda has already included the rate and then the duration. If I tell you the lambda, there's already a combination of uh, alpha and t. Uh, so x is the actual number of calls, which is a random variable. I want to find uh, the probability that x is bigger than four, which means that what is the probability that you're gonna get more than four phone calls over this duration of time? And uh, p of uh, x less than equals to five, what is the probability that you get less than or equals to five phone calls within this period of time? Let's say your lambda is some number, some constant. So to calculate that, uh, you can see it, it's fairly easy. Uh, the probability of uh, x being bigger than four is one minus the probability that x is less than or equals to four. That's just the complement. And then the probability that x is less than or equals to four, you just count uh, the, the k from zero to four, and that is the Poisson PMF. Just add all the Poisson PMFs from zero, one, two, all the way to four. That would be the probability of uh, x less than or equals to four. One minus that, you get this um, probability of x bigger than four. Uh, similarly, if you want to calculate the probability that x is less than or equals to five, you just sum the PMF from zero to five, including the five. Uh, here is a, um, a remark. Uh, lambda is the average number of phone calls, so lambda is one can be achieved by having alpha equals to 0.5 and t equals to two. Or it can be achieved by alpha equals to 3 and t equals to 0.33. And you can have any combination of alpha and t to give you the same lambda. All right, so this is uh, a very simple example showing you how do we calculate the probability. But then how do we uh, calculate the, um, the expectation? So if x is a Poisson random variable, I can show that the expected value of the um, Poisson random variable is lambda, and then the variance is also lambda. Uh, the proof goes as follows. Uh, if you look at the expected value of x, then what you're doing is that you're gonna sum uh, this p of k. k goes from zero to infinity. So this is the state, this is the uh, PMF, and this, the, the derivation goes as follows. This is um, lambda to the power k divided by k factorial e minus lambda. Correct? So this is the PMF. And now I can move out this term because this has nothing to do with my running index k. So I can move it out. So you have e to the power minus lambda. And then you have the summation. And you have this lambda to the power k divided by k minus 1 factorial. Uh, this k and the k factorial, you have one term got canceled. So you have left with uh, k minus one factorial. And the running index has to go from one to infinity. You have to change from zero to one for the following reason. When k is zero, what do you have in this equation? It's zero. So I do not need to include that. Okay, so when k equals to one, I need to start to include that. And so when you go down to this equation here, um, I do not need to start with a zero because the zero is zero according to the previous formula. And in addition, if you put a zero here, you have zero minus one factorial, that's not defined, right? So you cannot include a zero here. So when you go to this equation, uh, what do we have? Well, that's a little bit easy thing because you can pull out one lambda you can pull out one lambda, 
And then here you will uh, have lambda to the power k minus 1 divided by k minus 1 factorial. So you have both uh, k minus 1 in the numerator and k minus 1 in the denominator, and k starts from 1. Uh, then you can do the following uh, substitution. So you can say L equals to 0 to infinity and lambda to the power L in uh, L factorial. Well, L equals to a k minus 1. Just replace all the k minus 1 by another symbol called L. Then what is this? What is this? This is an infinite series, a well-known infinite series that we talk about in lecture number one. Yes, please. E to the lambda. So you have lambda times E minus lambda times E lambda. So life is very good. Cancel, cancel. OK? So life is good. So you have lambda. And of course, you need to smile. So this is the expected value of uh, x. Uh, you can do the same thing for the uh, second moment. Then uh, subsequently, you can derive the variance, which will be left to you as an exercise. Uh, if, you don't, if you're lazy, that's fine. You can go to the textbook. The textbook has a proof. Okay, so I will skip that. Now, um, what do we understand this formula? Now, this is a, that's a little bit interesting here. Your expected value is lambda. Your variance is also lambda. That's something interesting. Now think about a normal distribution. Of course, we haven't talked about normal distribution, but I guess most of you already know what is normal distribution. You have a mean, you have a variance. The mean is not going to corrupt your variance. The, cor the, the variance is not going to interact with your mean. Right? You have two different parameters. Mean and variance, they're two different things. Uh, let's say you take a test. The, the, the average and also the standard deviation, they're two different things. Right? They, they never work with each other. But here, in this Poisson random variable, your mean is lambda, the variance is also lambda. So what will happen is the following. You take a picture. Right? You take a picture. We know that the, the random variable, which is the, uh, the, the pixel value that you get, is a random variable. Right? It depends on the brightness of the scene. So you go to the pixel there. It is a very, very, very dark pixel. Okay? You have a small lambda. Then you calculate the average, fine, the average will be a small number. Then you calculate the variance. The variance will be small according to this derivation here, small variance. Now you take a picture of, the same, of, of, of a bright pixel, higher mean, higher variance. So you get more fluctuation of that bright pixel. Okay, so that's very different if you think about uh, the, the typical way of uh, generating some normal distribution. Normal distribution says that, oh, right, this is the image. This is the mean, mean will be the, the, the actual C, and then I start to generate um, a, a, a uniform level of noise across the, all the pixels, right? So the noise is, 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 uh, is the same level across everyone. But then, according to this Poisson distribution, brighter pixels, you will have more noise. Darker pixels, you have less noise. That's the difference. Okay, um, and so whenever you see the Poisson distribution, uh, there is a spatially varying noise compared to a Gaussian noise. We say that it, the Gaussian noise is spatially invarying. Now, there is something I need to comment on, which is the Cantor intuition here. We just said that. For the Poisson random variable, brighter pixels, they have more noise. Darker pixels, they have less noise, right? According to this formula. But let us just take a picture. Let's use a camera. Of course, this is not a real camera, but let's run a simulation. Uh, you set this lambda to be a, a number between 0 and 1. This is a number between 0 and 10. This is a number between 0 and 100. Now, you can do that. You just download an image. The image will be 8 bit. Uh, you turn it to 0 and 1. It could be uh, uh, it, it's a real number between 0 and 1. That, that would be your lambda. And then you just call Poisson or random dot Poisson random variable in Python. All right? 
random dot Poisson. Uh, so uh, you, you call that, um, then you're going to generate an image, a grayscale image, uh, where the pixel values uh, will be a random variable. Then uh, if a lambda is between 0 and 1, you get this. Whereas the lambda is between 0 and 100, you get that. But recall that we just said that if you have a higher lambda, your image would be noisier because, noisier because you have more noise. You have more noise, right? Variance is bigger. Uh, if you have a small lambda, I just told you that the, the variance will be smaller. How come this experiment is the opposite? How come this experiment is the opposite? What has gone wrong? Either my argument or this simulation. Something has gone wrong. Otherwise, you wouldn't get, you, it has to match. There's something not consistent. What has gone wrong? Yes, please. Correct. Lambda is the amount of full time receiving. Okay. So, so you're saying that uh, if lambda is a, a small number, then you only get zero or one or maybe up to two, right? So you have more, more fluctuations. Uh, if you have zero to 100, then you have more fine grain the values. Uh, and so uh, that is going to give you um, um, a better image. That, that's, that's, that's a true observation according to the image, right? So that makes sense. But then I have a formula. The variance of x is big when your lambda is big. Yes. Could it be the signal to noise ratio? This is an excellent point. Okay, do you guys hear that? The signal to noise ratio. Um, so when you when you think about this uh, realistic problem here, there are two things going on. One is your x, the other one is your variance. Variance will account for the noise. That's true, okay? As you get a bigger lambda, you do get more variance. That's true, you do get more noise. This expected value of x is the signal. It's the signal, okay? So as you get a higher lambda, your signal also goes up. Your signal also goes up. Then you ask, is the growth of the signal stronger than the growth of the noise? Now, how do we measure that? Um, the, the way to measure that is defined, I think, called the SNR, signal to noise ratio. Um, signal to noise ratio is defined as the expected value of x divided by the square root of variance of x. Now, I do need to take the square root, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. Here is the magnitude. If you, pick, if you only put a variance here, then that's the, 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 the denominator will be energy. Right? You, you need to make sure that there is no square, and so there is no square in the denominator. If you put a variance, then you need to put a, you put a square in the, in the, in the numerator, right? so, so, so that you get a consistent definition of SNR. OK, so once the SNR is defined, then you can see that uh, for Poisson random variable, you have a lambda in the numerator, and then you have square root in the denominator. And therefore, you have the uh, square root of lambda as the SNR. So what it means is that, yes, your, your noise is going up as you, uh, become, if you, as you become brighter and brighter, right? So the noise is there. However, your signal grows even faster. Your signal grows much faster than your noise, and as a result, the, the growth of the signal compensates for the growth of the noise. And therefore, overall speaking, your image is still very good. So uh, this is a little th interesting thing about the Poisson random variable. Uh, the, the mean grows with lambda. The variance also grows with lambda. However, there's a, another thing called SNR for you to um, match. Uh, what you see in the formula and what you actually encounter in the, uh, in the physical system. Now, uh, the, the spatially varying nature of the Poisson random variable makes uh, 
all these signal processing very, very hard. Very hard, okay. So uh, behind your camera or behind your cell phone, there is an image pro signal processor, ISP chip. That chip has to do a lot of signal processing, including denoising, HDR fusion, uh, uh, white balance, and the tone mapping, all kinds of things. Uh, I can tell you that the, if you take a picture at a very low light situation, very low light, that Poisson kind of uh, property comes out, it becomes a lot more dominant over the, 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 the Gaussian part, then you need to start to deal with this spatially varying noise. What I mean by spatially varying noise is that you have an image, you have bright region, you have dark region, the dark region will appear to be a lot worse than the bright region. So within the same image, you have some areas that you have more noise, some areas you have less noise. If you define, if you design an image denoiser, image denoiser, let's say you train a deep neural network, okay, you train a deep neural network, uh, you train a deep neural network, you, you, need to, you need to specify the noise level. You need to specify the noise level. Are you gonna handle the medium noise level, or you're gonna handle the, 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 the low noise level, or are you gonna handle the, uh, the high noise level? So no matter what level you choose, you're gonna make one part of the image happy, but the other part of the image unhappy. Just the spatially varying nature of the noise will make the problem very hard. Now, of course, nowadays you can train a, uh, a transformer, uh, the visual transformer that has uh, the, the, all these uh, gate attention, all these mechanisms um, you put in there, then uh, you start to uh, be able to handle different variations. But uh, on your cell phones today, they are not able to load this kind of gigantic models, so they're still using a lot cheaper models. So for those models, you do not have this capability of handling the spatially varying noise. So that, that is posing a lot, a lot of challenges to the uh, signal processing. <clears throat> the Gaussian noise uh, is a lot easier to deal with. Um, the source of the Gaussian noise is usually the read noise. The read noise doesn't depend on the C, just so you know, okay? The read noise is always coming from the circuit. Uh, as long as you read the signal, you, you, you go from the, uh, the, the, the charge to the uh, voltage and then to the ADC and all of the digital readout, passing through all the wires to your memory. That process, you have uh, read noise. That has something to do with your, your, your actual scene. The photon shot noise comes from the scene. The brighter the signal it is, uh, then the, the higher the SNR it will be. Okay, so this slide summarizes what we, whatever we have just talked about. This is the signal to noise ratio is given by this formula. Okay, any questions so far? Yes, please. Ah, yes, so that's a good cool question. Who defined this SNR? So this SNR is, uh, is, is well defined in the literature, okay? So besides expectation variance, this is also a, a well-defined quantity. Uh, SNR, there are different, different definitions of the SNR, okay? It depends on, on how, you, how you look at the problem. SNR, as, as it is called, it is the ratio of the signal power over the noise power, okay? Signal power over the noise power. So how do you define the signal power? Well, the signal power uh, is usually just an uh, expected value of x uh, squared. Uh, the noise power uh, is, is the variance of x. So that's the signal power divided by the noise power, right? So now the, the, the SNR has to be defined as an expected value of x squared divided by uh, the variance of x, right? Uh, so that would be the SNR. But typically, you know, you're double E students, right? So you know, we, we, we sort of prefer to calculate these things in the decibel, right? You, you, you convert this thing in the log scale. So you put a log 10 over here, right? Put a log 10 here so that you can calculate the decibel. Then the square doesn't really matter. The square doesn't really matter because the square can go out. So this is the same as two times the log 10 of expected value of x divided by the square root of variance of x. So this is also a well-defined thing. 
Uh, sometimes people also put 10 in front, so you get 20. Uh, so this is in, uh, in DB. You can see that you can use the square as a definition. You can also, without the square, you can use it as a definition. Depends on which field. I would say if you're a communication system people, you would look at the power because the power of the transmission. Uh, if, you're a signal, if you are an image sensor person like me, then you wouldn't care about the power. You care about the actual amplitude of your signal, so that would be uh, without a square. So either one would be fine. And this is what we call the output, output uh, SNR, that you really measure the SNR at the output of the sensor. You can also go all the way back and say, what is the input SNR? Um, that's another definition which would involve a lot more calculation. Um, to do that, you need to uh, do some kind of nonlinear mapping to make sure that you get a uh, small, they, they call it a small signal theory. So there's a perturbation theory that goes through, so you go all the way back and then look at the transfer function and then invert it. So that's called an input SNR. So a little bit more involved. Uh, usually when we talk about image sensor design, we will stick with uh, this uh, output SNR, which is, which is really this one. Okay, expected value divided by the variance. Uh, other questions? Good? Okay, so uh, let's uh, spend a couple minutes to talk about the origin of the Poisson random variable. Now, um, <clears throat> this is an important question to me, at least personally, because uh, I can really understand Bernoulli binomial geometric uh, without any problem. But uh, this interesting thing, lambda to the power k divided by k factorial e minus lambda, I don't really know where it, where it comes from. Do you know? I don't know. Okay, so, uh, so we need to go back uh, and see where does this uh, beautiful formula come from. Uh, in fact, a lot of textbooks, they don't tell you. Most of the statistics textbooks. Uh, um, I guess um, uh, it, it's hard to associate physics with statistics, right? So uh, usually statistics, they deal with uh, big data. Uh, physics, they care about uh, uh, physics. Okay, so here's a physics perspective. Um, um, uh, it's the same uh, analogy, and whether you care about photon arrivals or whatever, okay, arri whatever arrivals, it's, it's, it's sort of uh, this elementary assumption. Um, we are going to make three assumptions of the physical process, and from this uh, assumptions, we can derive the Poisson PMF. Now, um, not all the arrival process will satisfy these three assumptions. And I can give you examples later on where the assumptions were violated, then you wouldn't get the Poisson formula. The three assumptions are as follows. They're very easy to understand, okay? So you set up a time t. Then you set up a delta t, the calculus, okay? Time t and delta t. Delta t is a small delta, um, small increment. And then you say that uh, let this delta t be extremely small, usual calculus trick. Then you ask, Within this delta period, okay, so this is t, this is delta t, within this delta t period, the probability of getting one additional photon, okay, getting one additional photon is given by this alpha times delta t. Alpha is the arrival rate and t is the, um, the, the duration. Uh, now, we, don't, we, we have to accept it, okay, this is an assumption. There is a linear process that the rate times the time will give you the probability. And because this delta t is extremely small, we, we, we're okay uh, to make sure that this alpha times t will be less than one. It got to be a really small number. Okay, so, uh, and then on the left-hand side of this equation, there's a probability. Inside the probability, of course, there's an event. The event says that uh, x of t plus one, so the x of t plus one, which is the total number of counts during this t plus delta t time, minus x t, which minus the, the in original uh, chunk, that would be the number of photons within the delta t. So we say that the, within the delta t, there is one photon. What is the probability? Alpha times delta t. It has to be less than one, small number. That's my assumption, okay? Uh, and we don't have to debate, how, oh, whether, whether your alpha times delta t will be bigger than one. Uh, no, you are the user, you can always make the delta t extremely small. Not small enough, make it even smaller. So you can always make that to be less than one. Now, uh, so that's the first assumption. The second assumption is just a complement of the first one. Uh, 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 there's no more than one ele there's no more than one uh, photon electron arrival uh, in this period of time. Okay, so so it's a binary decision, either one or zero. So if you get a zero, it's one minus alpha times t. 
Uh, so if you do not have this assumption, then something will go wrong. You, if it is not one, you can get two, right? So uh, the assumption two guarantees you that you have a binary case. Not one, then it got to be zero. It cannot get zero, two, or three. Okay, so that's the requirement for uh, the second assumption. The third one is that uh, uh, as long as the duration, they do not overlap, um, every arrival will be independent. So one arrival wouldn't interfere the arrival of the other one. Okay, so three very basic assumptions I guess we, we will agree on. We don't have to debate on the, the validity of, of these assumptions. Now, once you have these assumptions in, in place, then uh, l let, me, let me write down a couple of things. What do we want? Well, we want to derive the PMF, but to be derive the PMF, I need to do some calculation. Uh, the thing I want to look at is the probability that uh, x of t equals to k. Okay? Uh, Sorry, uh, x probability of x of t plus delta t uh, equals to k. I'll just follow this um, <coughs> notes here. Okay, so how do how how do I calculate this probability that x of t plus delta t equals to k? Now there are two possibility that can lead to this outcome. One is that uh, at time t uh, you have um, you have k minus one. The other case is that at time in t, you already have k, okay? Right, so these are the two possibilities that can lead you to this uh, uh, k. So the first case is that at time t, you, you only have k minus one, and so then you need to calculate the probability uh, 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 one uh, photon in delta t. Okay, so then the other case would be that you already have k uh, photons, then it would be a zero uh, photon in delta t. That's just the multiplication of, of the two events, right? So it's an n case. Uh, you have k, you want to know what is the probability that you get k photons uh, at t plus delta t. Well, I can decompose it into two smaller events. One says that I have a k minus one photons at t, uh, the other one says that I have um, k photons at t, right? Then I just need to look at one delta t, small delta t. Then uh, this one says that if you are k minus one, then there should be one more photon in delta t to make up this k. Or if you already have k photons, then you, will ha you shouldn't have any photon in this delta t to make up this case. So the, these two cases, when you add it together, it will give you the original one. Now, life is easy because this one, according to my assumption, this is just alpha delta t. This is, is uh, one minus alpha delta t. I have these two. So then I will have uh, this probability of x of t plus delta t equals to k, which is my left-hand side. I can write it as the probability of x of t uh, equals to k minus one times alpha delta t plus the probability of x of k, uh, x t equals to k, uh, times uh, one minus alpha delta t. I have an equation set up, okay? I have the left-hand side, I do some calculation on the right-hand side, I show something. At this point, it's still unclear how I can get the PMF, right? It's still unclear. But let me do a, a one more trick. Let me move the terms around by, um, by grouping this and that on the left-hand side. Okay, now I have many terms on the, on the right-hand side, but I'm gonna move from time to the uh, left-hand side. Then I have a P of X of T plus delta T equals to K minus the P of X of T equals to K, right? So that will be something on the left-hand side. And now I have something on the right-hand side, which is the uh, P of X T equals to k minus one, that is uh, alpha delta t, and I have minus of uh, p x of t equals to k, and then I have alpha delta t. Right, so I'm moving the terms around. Then I can do one more thing, then things will become clear. How about I divide both sides by delta t? Then on the left-hand side, I have a ratio of x of t plus delta t equals to k, minus the p of x of t equals to k, divide by delta t. 
Then on the uh, right hand side, I, ha I have this difference x of t equals to k minus 1. There is an alpha. Uh, and then I have um, a minus of p of x of t equals to k, again times alpha. Okay, so I have a difference between these two terms. So let us look at this thing here. This thing here. This is something x plus delta t minus something at t divided by t divided by delta t. Does it look familiar? Let me let me recall. X plus delta x minus f x divided by delta x. What is it? It's just a slope. Exactly. So that's a slope. Okay. So you can set a slope and then set the delta t equal to zero, limit delta t equals to zero. You get that this is d d a t of this probability of x of t equals to k. That's a derivative. Okay? On the right hand side, you have this alpha times the difference between these two probabilities, x of t equals to k minus 1, minus the probability x of t equals to k. You have a derivative on the left hand side, you have some polynomials on the right hand side. What is it called? Ordinary differential equation, the subject I hate the most, right? Okay, so you get this, PD, you get this ODE, and now I can tell you, because you have this ODE here, there's a solution to this ODE, and guess what is the solution to this ODE? So solution to this ODE to this ordinary differential equation is that p x t equals to k is guess. Okay, and of course I'm not wasting your time. It got to be this, uh, and then e to the power minus blah 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 t. Why? Okay, so here's the beauty of being an engineer instead of a mathematician. Engineer, the solution is that you take this result. You put it in, and you verify, and see if it matches the left-hand side with the right-hand side. Now, if you're a mathematician, it's a lot harder, and of course, you need to solve, right? <laughs> uh, so, so we can just put it in, and now, I'm, of course, I'm skipping, and putting in. So put it in, then, then you show that the left-hand side equals to the right-hand side. And, of course, I've, I've done it um, and on this slide. Uh, y, plug it in, show that equal, okay? So life is good. So we found it. We found that the PMF, the PMF is given by this equation. Uh, and so all we need to do is just to define lambda equals to alpha t, then you can show that x equals to k, which is a PMF, is given by this beautiful Poisson equation. So when will this photon arrival not following this Poisson equation. It happens, when your, it happens when your assumptions are violated. When will it violate? Well, it's easy. Don't shoot the laser in vacuum. Okay, don't shoot the laser in vacuum. Put some molecules. <laughs> put some chalks, okay? Uh, put some water molecules, fog, okay? So then in those cases, the, the, the photon wouldn't go to you strictly. There's always bouncing back and interference, scattering effect, attenuation. So as you get to you, it's no longer a very simple process. Then your, your, your assumptions were all violated and life is not good. Then you wouldn't have a Poisson equation. You need to derive all the kinds of very, very difficult distributions. Uh, and so uh, just bear in mind that the Poisson assumption is a very, very good one when you talk about a vacuum or typically this kind of uh, imaging environment, so that will work. But if you do a bizarre random media, then, uh, then the Poisson assumptions will be violated. Okay, so um, let's just stop at this point and then um, uh, I will see you on Friday for the midterm. And as we come back, uh, We'll move on to a new chapter uh, on uh, chapter four, so please also prepare the, the slides. Okay, so see you later.